here's what I want you to get out of this. There is an invitation, um, and I, I, we're going to dig into these two criminals, and we're going to look at who they were and what happened with them, but what has to stand sort of over both of them, and then the invitation to each of us as people is, will you be his companion in the garden? Not just on the other side of eternity, because guess what? We're all going to transition. Who, who said, what is it, death and taxes, you know? I mean, it, it, we will all cross over into eternity, right? That We will all meet that day. And those of us who are in Jesus have an invitation to walk hand in hand with him in paradise. But there's this other invitation that Jesus is actually extending even to this thief in this moment because he's literally embracing him into this journey and into this relationship now. It's really, really powerful. It's so intimate. And I hope that as we sort of unfold this that you can get your head around it, not for knowledge's sake. If you're getting to know me at all, it's like I don't much care about the knowledge, but I really care that you grasp the very heart and person of Jesus, and that as you go from this place, that you're able to journey more deeply and intimately with him, because he wants to go with you, and walk with you, and go before you, and behind you, and lead with you, uh, lead life uh, with you. Okay, here we go. Um, so uh, let's, uh, let's shift, and we're going to come back to this imagery of sort of walking in the garden together, but let's shift and take a look at these two criminals. Um, so you have an interaction where Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's, he's been nailed in. He's breathing. We talked about that last week, suffering as he, he takes each breath. And you have two other criminals who are crucified next to him. Now, let's talk about some similarities between both of them. Um, both criminals are suffering the pain of crucifixion, Yeah? They're, they're both in pain. Um, both of these guys are guilty of a serious crime, potentially even a violent assault or an armed robbery. Um, both of these guys are able to see that there's a sign over Jesus' head that says King of the Jews, which denotes that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And they can even begin to uh, play that out and recognize that that also means he's the Savior of the world. So both of these guys are seeing all this. Now, the other thing that's happened is both of these guys, as they hang there, we talked about it last week, but they've just heard Jesus say, who remembers? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So these people are watching Jesus mocked. They're watching Jesus insulted. They're watching Jesus hated, uh, be hated. They're watching Jesus be reviled and abused and violated again and again. And and they are watching everyone turn on him. And then they're watching Jesus um, absorb all that hatred and negativity. And then instead of doing what most of us do when people uh, send something negative our way, what do we do? We usually send it right back. But Jesus, no, 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 not this Jesus. He absorbs all of that negativity. And instead what he reflects back is, Father, forgive them. So both of these criminals are hanging here, and they're all of a sudden um, forced to see and interact with, because they can't go anywhere, right? They are forced to see and interact with divine grace at work, divine mercy at work, divine love at work, divine sacrifice at work. And there's two huge responses um, that are very different in these two guys between what they see and what they experience and what's going on in their own hearts. And that's what I want us to look at today, and that's kind of what I want to call us as a people into is how are you responding? How are we responding to the difficulty and suffering in our lives? Because that's kind of what Dr. Luke is getting at. Dr. Luke wrote this book that we're reading um, as he penned it. Yeah? Am I making sense? Somebody nod your head and tell me. Okay, good. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, so here we are. Um, both of these men, last similarity, I think want to be uh, saved from the certain death that is happening to them. But isn't it interesting that only one responds? Isn't it fascinating? Why is it that only one of these two men who experienced the very same thing responds to King Jesus? Let's look further. <clears throat> I think uh, many of us have similarities to these two guys. Let's talk about a, a few um, similarities that we might have. M many of us have either been through or will go through significant difficulty, suffering, um, or trials in our life. These guys are right in the middle of uh, the difficulty of the, the, they're fighting for their lives. Most of us have experienced some level of that. Um, there's not one of us in the room who could say, we don't deserve what's happening to us. 
Um, most of us have seen or heard about this Jesus, right? Because these two guys hang in there. They've seen the sign. They may have even seen his life and miracles. He's, they've been living in the same country. They've heard him uh, profess forgiveness, love, forgiveness, and, and grace. Um, so they've, they've seen and experienced him. And then most of us want to be saved from some sort of death. Relational, physical, um, the pain of isolation. We could go on and on and on. But we want to be saved um, from uh, maybe the death that we're currently in or experiencing. So now let's talk about the first thief. So this is the guy who um, says, uh, one of the criminals, verse 39, who hung there hurled insults at him. So let's talk about the first thief. So the, the first thief um, probably uh, creates, draws a line, or Dr. Lucas, he pens this, is drawing a line between the two different ways that we can respond to difficulty and hardship in our lives. So the first thief um, is literally responding like, if you're God, save me. Uh, this is probably not unlike if we tried to make it current and modern. When you get in a, um, in a jam um, perhaps you never look at God, you're never praying, you're never interacting, you're never opening your Bible, you don't grasp that you're in a relationship, but you get in a, uh, a jam of some kind, and what do many of us say when we get in a bad spot? God help us. I don't know that what we're calling for in that moment is actually a deep, intimate, ongoing relationship with Jesus. We're more just saying, almost like the genie rubbed the lamp, come out here and get me out of this mess. And that's kind of what I think this criminal is literally saying is he's going, uh, if you're God, which I'm not sure I believe you are, but if you're God, I'll, I'll give you a try. Why don't you save yourself and save me? So there's no um, penitence. There's no humility. There's no love or even life. It's kind of this uh, sort of demanding, um, almost narcissistic, self-focused, I'll try anything to get me out of this jam. That's kind of what the idea that you get that this first thief is sort of in. And then <clears throat> it's, it's almost like um, a, a matter of uh, sort of blasé or convenience to him. If you can get me off this cross, I'll take it. And you begin to see that um, suffering or the difficulty that he's in the middle of interrupts his sort of life and his trajectory and what he wants. And yet, there's no humility, there's no contrition, there's no repentance, there's no softness of heart, and instead, you actually get him mocking Jesus, hurling insults at him. We don't even know what insults he hurled, but he's literally saying he, this guy hurled insults at Jesus, and he was ugly. 